So infectious diseases um, remain a very big problem for us, despite the enormous advances made in the last 150 years in understanding what actually causes them, the germs that actually cause them, and in making drugs and vaccines, we're still stuck with infectious diseases. M some of this is of our own doing. The current measles outbreak in Wales is a, a painful example of that. Uh, it seems to be quite easy to forget that measles is actually a really nasty disease and kills, currently kills, still kills, hundreds of thousands of children, mainly in sub-Saharan Africa, where they don't have access to the kinds of um, healthcare and preventative medicine that would deliver the vaccine in time. It's estimated that two million deaths are um, from diseases that are actually preventable by vaccines, and a good many other people die of diseases for, we ha for which we have no vaccines, like malaria and AIDS. So the question that you might be asking is, why is it that we have vaccines for some diseases and not for others? And what I'm going to try and persuade you <laughs> is that it's easier to understand that by visualizing the infectious disease agent, the pathogen, as having at its disposal, being in possession of a wardrobe from which it is obliged to pick an outfit, some kind of outfit, in order to be able to infect us and to survive within us. So now this creature that I've drawn for you, actually my, my uh, daughter drew her. <laughs> so this creature is standing in for a whole range of different infectious disease agents, um, ranging from viruses like measles or uh, HIV, the virus that causes AIDS, to bacterial pathogens like TB, to slightly larger parasites like malaria, shown here um, bursting out of a red blood cell, which is where it spends a uh, considerable proportion of its life, and even, uh, sorry, I'm supposed to stand here, aren't I? It's just the lights. Um, even um, some worms qualify as infectious disease agents. Here I've shown you uh, what you see a tiny uh, filarial worm, which is um, small enough, in fact, to be taken from one person to another by mosquitoes and causes a rather unpleasant disease known as filariasis. So our little cartoon here is actually standing in for all of these different diseases. When um, an infectious disease agent manages to breach our innate defenses, our first-line defenses, and infect an individual, infect us, what it does is it establishes itself within us and it starts to, typically it will start to grow, and that makes us feel ill, become ill, uh, sometimes severely ill, and we risk dying in this process. But at the same time, our immune systems start to respond and produce cells and antibodies that will combat the infection, and in many cases, um, we manage to eventually defeat the parasite, the, or the infectious disease agent, get rid of it, and become immune. So when we're immune, we, these little soldiers now are, of course, representing the immune system, which um, is capable of destroying this infectious disease agent. And what vaccination aims to do is actually take us from the state of being susceptible to an infectious disease agent to being immune, bypassing that state of infection where, of course, you can get ill and die. How can we do this? How do we make someone immune without risking, uh, without actually infecting them or um, causing them to, to suffer the disease? Well, one way to do it is actually to kill the bug, and then you take the killed bug and shove it in a syringe and, and shove the... <laughs> shove the dead bugs into the arm of someone you want to immunize. That's one way of doing it. You don't always have to kill the bug. You can actually just cripple it a little bit, knock it on the head and, and attenuate it, as it's uh, known in technical terms. And then you take these bugs, which have uh, become less aggressive, not ab no longer able to cause disease, and again, stick them in a syringe and put them in the arm of someone you want to immunize. And, and that actually works. Works for measles, for example. You can actually strip the bug of its clothes and just stick those clothes in a syringe and put those clothes, make sure those get into um, the bloodstream of someone you want to immunize. Vaccines for uh, hepatitis B, for example, uh, do exactly that. What this 
brings us to is what the clothes actually signify. What the, the reason why it's sense reasonable to represent the infectious disease agent as being um, it, it used this wardrobe analogy for an infectious disease agent is because those clothes, those elements of its outfit, are actually what the, path uh, the immune system sees. It's what the immune system recognizes the pathogen by. What might these be? Well, they could be fragments on the surface, for example, of a, a loop that a virus uses to attach to a host cell in order to be able to get into the host cell. They could be some kind of pore on the surface of a bacterial pathogen, which is necessary for it to gain nutrients in order to survive. In the case of malaria, what malaria, the malaria parasite does is it's sitting in a red blood cell, but what it does is it sticks some proteins on the surface of the red blood cell, and these proteins allow the infected red blood cell to stick to the linings of our blood vessels. And those proteins are the target, main target of protective immunity against malaria. So all of these things, these, um, what these garments represent, are actually bits and pieces of the infectious disease agent, the bug, that it needs, that are absolutely critical to its survival. <coughs> so it doesn't have the option of coming back, of reinvading without these clothes. These clothes are absolutely central to its survival. But what it can do is it can come back dressed in a completely different outfit. If you've been infected by the bug dressed in all in green, your immune system is on alert against that bug in its green outfit, but it cannot recognize the same bug if it comes back dressed in a white outfit. And this opens up an option, a possibility, for reinfecting individuals, for re-emerging within populations, which is exploited by a number of infectious agents, including um, malaria, um, HIV, and influenza. Influenza, for example, um, what, what's assumed to happen with influenza is that you first get, when you get an epidemic of influenza, all the bugs in that epidemic are dressed, in, they're all dressed similarly, they're all dressed in the same, same outfit. And what is, what's assumed to happen is that then, of course, m many of the people who get infected will then have immune responses that recognize that bug. And what it's supposed to do, what it is assumed to do, is then go away and slowly change its outfit until it finds a new suit, a new um, costume, if you like, which is not something that people recognize anymore. And this allows it to come back and reinvade and cause a new epidemic. So wh what's happening in biological terms is the virus is mutating slowly until it can no longer be recognized by uh, the immune responses that are prevalent in the population. Now this option is not available to all bugs. Measles, for example, has a very limited wardrobe. You could call it a measly wardrobe. <laughs> <laughs> and so what that means is once you get measles and you recognize it by its outfit, it can never come back again. Measles cannot infect you again once you've had it you get long-term, lifelong protective immunity from infection of measles. And these are the bugs that we've been able to successfully make vaccines against. You can appreciate that job is much easier when you have such a limited outfit. So things like measles, mumps, rubella, diphtheria, these are all bugs that have a very small wardrobe and of which we can very quickly gain the measure and make a vaccine. By contrast, things like influenza are, have a much wider diversity of outfits in their wardrobes, and this is why it's been, it's, much, uh, it's a much bigger challenge to make vaccines against um, influenza and it's, it's <coughs> or malaria and other diseases which continue to take a huge toll on us. So, we actually can make vaccines against inf influenza. When you have an epidemic, you take the strain and you say, oh, it's wearing green outfit. Uh, let's make a vaccine against the strain. Uh, you attenuate it and you make a vaccine.
But within two or three years, that vaccine stops working because now the virus has gone and changed its outfit. So there is this idea, this notion that perhaps influenza does have this really limitless, very, very large anyway, wardrobe. And that what we're going to be doing from now on is be running this kind of rather unsatisfactory arms race with the virus, in which it comes sporting an outfit, we develop a vaccine, then it goes away, comes back in a new outfit, we make a new vaccine, that we're locked into this cycle with influenza. But does influenza really have such a large wardrobe? There are things about the way it behaves that don't really jive with it having a really big wardrobe. For example, this whole business of changing from one outfit to another and causing a new epidemic, this, if it has a really large wardrobe, it suggests that it would must have very restricted access to the wardrobe to, to do this in such a sort of gradual way. What I mean to say is that what you'd really expect is once an epidemic was caused by a particular strain, everything dressed all the same, that in the next generation, if it's got this huge wardrobe, um, what you'd really w expect to see is a very large population of viruses all dressed differently. That is to say, the influenza viruses all <coughs> mutate quite rapidly. If they've got lots of things they can be, why don't we just see this soup of strains, this rainbow of viruses? Why is it that, that we don't see that? Why is it that instead we see what seems to be a very slow kind of march towards a new state, a process that scientists call antigenic drift? So to explore, to, to see if we could come up with a better um, explanation for why influenza behaves as it does, we decided to explore the hypothesis that influenza actually has unlimited access to rather a limited wardrobe. That is to say that the various things that it's, it can be are actually not quite as diverse, obviously much more diverse than flu, but not absolutely unlimited, but that it can sport any of these quite readily. And these are consistent with what we know about the biology of the virus. How do we explore such a hypothesis? Well, the way we do it is by making mathematical models of um, the disease processes. And I'm just showing you this um, almost, I'm just giving you a glimpse into the innards of a mathematical model, almost uh, just as an antidote to all these cartoons that I'm showing. But <laughs> I'm not going to go and spend time going into any detail about this, but I just want to show you the machinery. This is what we use to try and explore whether that kind of a hypothesis that kind of process could actually lead to the patterns that we observe. And what this model tells us is that it can. First of all, the model allows this kind of explosion in diversity of outfits that you'd expect the virus to be able to do, which is consistent with what we know about the biology of the virus. But what happens in the model is that if you remember, the pr immune responses to the virus that caused the original strain, which are now in place in many people in that population, anyone who has seen that strain before has immune responses which are on order to shoot anything that's wearing either a green hat, a green top, a green skirt, or green shoes in this case. That's the strain they've seen before. If the wardrobe of influenza is quite limited, this means that most of these combinations actually won't work. They won't be successful. They will simply be blown out of the water by pre-existing host immune responses. Which means that what will be left standing at the end of this process is sort of the single virus, if you like, which has just by chance managed to pick an outfit that doesn't overlap with the epidemic that came before. And that strain is now free to cause a new epidemic. So what we're headed towards is a new understanding of the wardrobe of influenza. So we're working with people who do experiments and, and, and field workers to try and establish whether influenza does in its wardrobe actually have some elements, some parts of its wardrobe that, that are far less variable than people have assumed it to be. Now it may still have something, like it may 
it's some part of its wardrobe. Maybe, maybe it has a whole range of hats that are very, very different to one another. But maybe when it comes to shoes, it's not Imelda Marcos. Maybe it does have just a very small range of, of, of shoes. And what our model suggests is that if we focus on these elements of its wardrobe that are less diverse than the others, then we might, in fact, be able to make a vaccine that would release us from this horrible cycle of having to update it every two or three years. In other words, that we might get to a point where the virus is all dressed up but has nowhere to go, which would be a very good thing. Thank you very much. <laughs>